join us this morning and you'll meet two of the leading ladies from the hit series L.A. Law, Susan Rattan and Michelle Green. You'll also get the inside scoop on Prince Charles and Princess Di, and you'll find out why fall is the busy season for divorce. And we'll have part two of our series, What Do Single Women Want? Plus, Dr. Tom Cottle talks about parents and teenagers. All of it on The Morning Program. Join us. Now you can go back to doing what you were doing. I was fixing my mic. Oh. Welcome. It's Tuesday, November 3rd. Good morning, Roland. Good morning. How are you today? I'm terrific today. How are you? Yeah, I'm terrific also. Tell me about it. Okay. Now, on our show this morning, we'll dish the latest gossip about uh, Charles and Ty <laughs> with James Whitaker of the London Daily Mirror. No, we will. We'll find out. I know. And we'll also meet two of the leading ladies from the hit series L.A. Law, Susan Rutan and Michelle Green. Harvard psychologist Tom Cottle will return with more advice on raising teenagers and we'll have a report on why autumn is the busiest season for divorce. Plus looking for Mr. Wright in part two of our special series, What Do Single Women Want? So, come on in. Our home is your home. It's the morning program. Starring Marriott Hartley, Rollin Smith. I'm Mark McEwen and here they are, Marriott and Rollin. We have a lot of teenagers in the audience yeah, this we morning. Do. Yeah, and we have Tom Cottle who's coming. He's going to answer all of your questions about why your parents misbehave. Well, and, parents um, don't misbehave. No, no, just kids do. Right. Come on, you're going to buy that? <laughs> um, I wouldn't go back to being a teenager for anything in the world, would you? No. Especially when they no, look. Like, you see that guy up there with the, the green hair? We're going to show him a little bit. We never, we never wore green hair when I was a kid. <laughs> to tell you something I have to my husband is French and he always tries to do colloquialisms and there's a wonderful street colloquial colloquial phrase that says I'm gonna pull somebody's cover which means I'm gonna tell them the truth mm -hmm. and one day my my husband said to me boy boy you really blew my blanket you really told it I said no 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 <laughs> fat it's pull pull somebody's cover anyway I'm gonna pull this one's cover this morning he came in at five o'clock this morning looking uh -huh. like this yeah. he drove in on Martha or George I came on George today. George today yeah. Looking like this. Can you believe that? So the wa George Washington, well, okay, the see, George see Washington my, Bridge. My and the watch fob that uh, Ruth, with, with your a, wife Ruth. Watch, Ruth, right. <laughs> and and I bought felt, you. I really felt that we needed some decorum here this morning. Particularly because uh, of the way I dress in the morning. Well, you came in with this big down jacket. And, uh, <laughs> I can't find clothes in the morning. <laughs> I'm like Colleen Dewhurst. I crawl to the bathroom. I try to find somebody else. No, anyway, so. Fall into a pile and come out. That, <laughs> that's exactly that's the way it looks. So you decided to, to be I did. I thought we needed one. to have some kind of, uh, you know, dignity here this morning. Boy, <laughs> you got it. Good. How about some birthdays? So, uh, yes, birthdays. Okay. Jill Ireland is going to be in our show tomorrow, and her husband has a birthday today. Charles, Charles Bronson. He's going old to be 66 years old. Jesus. How old? 66. Also, rock star Adam Ant. 33 years old today. Wow. He's pretty. How old is his heart? <laughs> I'm going to get those guys. That was guys. Tuesday, I think. Oh. Uh, boxer Larry Holmes is 38. Oh, How boy. All right. Happy birthday to all of them. And Mark, how are you this morning? I'm actually doing quite well this morning. I mean, seeing the guy with the green hair made me a happy man. <laughs> and um, seeing the watch was very nice. And seeing Mary in a down jacket this morning. I'm going home. See you later. <laughs> no, actually, let's talk a little weather here. What a beautiful day we have in New York City today. 50 degrees will be the, is actually the temperature right now. A little fog around Philadelphia, also parts of Camden. But from, I'd say, old Baltimore South, it's going to be just peachy. We're going to throw this little guy up here today because it's going to be just delightful out there. <laughs> Wear your Bermuda shorts. <laughs> Get warm because the temperature in the southeast today is going to be just gorgeous. And it's going to be moving up our way, so we'll see some warmer temperatures tomorrow. Maybe even... 80 degrees here in New York City. Down here in Florida, still lots of rain and high winds as that tropical depression slowly, actually not a tropical, I'll just call it a depression, is uh, moving towards the Keys. And uh, as I said, it has not been upgraded to a tropical storm or a hurricane, just some stormy weather down there and bringing a little rain and some high winds along with it. 60 degrees down in Louisiana this morning, 55 in Dallas. 59 degrees in Chicago, which is warmer than it is in New York City. And they're going to go up to, I think, the mid-70s today. Boy, I tell you, that's like a heat wave for this time of year for Chicago. Some rain in parts of Michigan again, also parts of Minnesota. As we come a little bit farther west, a little rain in this part of the country, which is Utah, Arizona, and parts of Nevada. 48 degrees is the temperature right now in San Francisco and way up in the lovely Pacific Northwest, almost 50, 49 degrees up in Seattle. That's a quick look at the national picture. Here's a forecast for your part of the world.
A very nice day ahead for Des Moines. Mostly cloudy, very mild, the high in the upper 60s to lower 70s. Tonight, mostly cloudy, the low 45 to 50. Currently in Des Moines, it's partly cloudy and 61 degrees. That's the weather up to the moment. Thank you, Marcus. Do you know that one of our crew got caught in that depression? Really? Or that hurricane? Or what? He's not that old. He didn't get caught oh, in the Corky. depression. But Corky. Corky's down in Jamaica. Yeah, he got caught in that. Whoa, well, we wish him well. He's back, though. Everything's fine, Good. right? Good. Messes up your vacation, I Just a little bit. Yeah, you just got a little rain, but it's nice. Robert Osborne's taking a few days off, so Mark is filling in with Who's News. Yes, indeed. And director Woody Allen is news this morning. Uh, he is one among many filmmakers urging President Reagan to support a cultural boycott of South Africa and protest of that country's apartheid regime. Filmmakers United Against Apartheid have, have, has asked the president's support in calling on the film industry to refuse distribution of films to South Africa. Now, more than 100 filmmakers signed a letter to Reagan, including Spike Lee, Martin Scorsese, and Susan Seidelman. Here's one for you. As usual, Jim and Tammy Baker are in the news, this time for postponing an 18-city preaching and singing tour. Listen to this. The Denver Post reported that 12 tickets had been sold for the Baker's appearance at the McNichols Sports Arena. Listen to this. Nashville's WKRN-TV said 14 tickets were sold in the first few hours for the tour opener at the 9,600-seat Nashville Municipal Auditorium. But a spokesman for the Bakers denies that the lack of ticket sales has anything to do with the postponement and will reschedule the tour for March. That had nothing to do with it. Joan Collins has won another round in avoiding support payments to ex-husband Peter Holm. There is, however, another hearing scheduled for January 22nd when arguments will be heard regarding the final division of the couple's property, including a house in the south of France, paintings and items of furniture, paintings and items of furniture that Collins claims Helm took from her. And finally, there's a story behind the cover of John Cougar Mellencamp's latest hit album, The Lonesome Jubilee. 73-year-old Woody Baker had no idea who John Cougar Mellencamp was. That is, until he met Mellencamp one day, soon found his picture smack on the cover of his big-selling album. Baker, who is a welder from Elnora, Indiana, said he was introduced to Mellencamp at Elnora's Midway Cafe and told John Cougar Mellencamp that they heard that he just wanted to talk with a regular working man. After an exchange of stories, comparison of tattoos, and several photos, it was clear that Baker was perfect to grace the cover of the Lonesome Jubilee, a typical working-class American Mellencamp sings so often about. And there you have it. That's who's news. Now, does that man get residuals from that album cover? I asked the uh -huh. same question. I'll bet he doesn't. But no. I bet you it's a kick to walk into a record store and say, come See? here. Yeah. That's me. That's me, <laughs> That's me right there. Right. Coming up next, live from Bonn, West Germany, James Whitaker of the London Daily Mirror will dish the latest royal dirt on Charles and Di's marriage. Plus comedian Mike Binder and a special edition of TV Watch. So stay for the day. This portion of the morning program is sponsored by Tandy Computers, because there is no better value. As you've probably noticed, the latest headlines from Germany haven't been about relations between East and West, but between Charles and Di. Their visit to Berlin marked one of their few joint appearances since mid-September. What's the latest with the Prince and the Princess? The man who knows is one of Britain's premier royalty watchers, James Whitaker of the London Daily Mirror. He's traveling with the royal couple, and he joins us this morning live from Bonn, West Germany. Good morning, Mr. Whitaker. Good morning. Well, what is the latest? What should we know about, about Di and Charles? What's going on over there? Well, the very latest, which happened just a few minutes ago, was that Diana had a glass of beer, which she hasn't done for a long time, and she got the froth all over her nose, which made Prince Charles laugh a lot. Oh, that's cute. Um, <laughs> but what I'm really talking yes. about, Mr. Whitaker, is the fact that they have been separated for, well, with several, several months. They haven't even been sleeping under the same roof. Right. Uh, is this recent trip to Bonn a, a tr trying at at, at least having the world see them together? What's going yes, on inside the relationship? Absolutely. No, there was one dreadful day from mid-September to mid-October, well, 35 dreadful days, when, without question, they did not spend one single night under the same roof, which is not a good thing. They weren't separated very far. They, um, 500 miles. He was in Scotland most of the time there, and she was down in London. They weren't together. And I've known them a long time, Mariette, I've known Diana since she was 16, and at the end of that period of time, 
she looked a very unhappy lady. And I think that's understandable. If you're husband and wife, you want to spend time together, and they weren't doing so. But now they're here in Germany, and they both made a big effort to show that they're together and that they're happy. I think there's, they reached a sort of truce. This is a very important trip, and they can't seem to be, be seen to be feuding on it. And I think that they look pretty happy on it. But whether all the problems are cured, only time will tell. What are some of those problems? I mean, we hear so many rumors over here, the fact that the age difference is something that's yeah. bothered uh, Lady Di, the fact that uh, she doesn't like Scotland. The fa There's so many, uh, so many reasons that we get. What do you yeah. understand? There, well, there are elements of truth in all of them. The 12 and a half year age gap is a big problem between them. It was always there. One of, the, one of the roommates of the princess told me the day after the engagement said the one thing that nearly stopped the princess saying, well, she was like Lady Diana Spencer then, of course, the one thing that stopped her nearly saying yes was that age gap. It has proved to be a problem. They hoped it wouldn't be, but it has. They have different tastes. She does like pop music. She likes going shopping and uh, much lighter things in life. He likes the opera, which he doesn't particularly like. He loves Scotland. Well, Diana likes it for about three days, but when they're there for three months, she gets pretty bored there. So they have very little in common, except for the children. And I must say, for that 35 days, one began to wonder whether they even had that in common, because the children missed Prince Charles, I think, a lot more than Diana did in that period. What's going on with the Australian last that we hear Charles linked up with? Yeah, Lady Dale Tryon we're talking about. He calls her Kanga. Well, yes, they are friends, but any suggestion that they're having an affair is very offensive and not true. What, what was failed to be said when the, the uh, Lady Tryon went up to Scotland was that her husband actually was there too. And Prince Charles has known him, Lord Tryon, a lot longer than Kanga. She is a great fun woman though. There have been one or two pictures lately which have been a bit unkind on her. She's actually quite a good looking lady and Prince Charles does enjoy her company. He's also godfather to one of the children. Mm -hmm. But, as I say, a suggestion of uh, an affair is very unfair. It does put a lot of pressure on them. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, we've spoken to Nigel Dempster and, uh, about, about divorce. Um, is it possible that a royal couple can divorce? And what would that do? What is all of this doing to the monarchy? Is the monarchy in crisis, indeed, or is that a dramatic look at it? Well... If it continued, them not seeing other, each other, yes, big crisis. The answer to your first question is, yes, they could get divorced. It would possibly end the monarchy if they did, but in leg legal terms, the Prince of Wales could divorce Diana and still succeed to the throne on the death of the Queen. In practical terms, I think there would be uproar in England. The Princess is a very popular lady, and I would think that people would say if he can't keep his act together with her, then really he's not fit to be king. And I could see in practical terms him being rejected as the next king. So we are talking of possibly the end of the monarchy if there were a divorce. But honestly, Mariette, it's, it's tough to talk like that because there won't be a divorce. This crisis is not as bad as has been made out, but it's not been too good either. We all have our uh, dips into what we would all consider too much visibility. Um, I have, you have, I'm sure. And it's a very tough thing to live through, to be constantly under the microscope of the press. Is there a way that, the, that they can back the press off? They've been talking about suits and things like that. What can happen? What kind of control can they have over the press? Yes, I, I think you've reached a, a very interesting situation. I don't know what the answer is, and the trouble is, neither does the Queen or her courtiers at Buckingham Palace. Neither do editors in Fleet Street. But there has got to be something worked out. I agree. I think the press have become too intrusive into their marriage. I think they put pressure on it, the amount they've written. But then what do you do? One doesn't want censorship. In fact, the, the freedom in America is even greater than it is in the UK. And I think it would be very unhealthy if we were censored in what we did. I think there's got to be a reining back in the amount of reportage that we do on the royal family. Give them a little bit more of a break. I think it's become too intrusive. We've got to censor ourselves a little bit more. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, James Whitaker. Thank you for inviting me.
Coming up next, we'll have a special edition of TV Watch, plus comedian Mike Binders to stay with us. It's time now for TV Watch, and since our television and movie critic Robert Osborne is taking a few days off, Mariette and I are going to fill in, take you back in time for a little home screen nostalgia. So here goes. The top five rated TV shows ten years ago. In the number five spot was ABC's Charlie's Angels, which starred Kate Jackson, Farrah Fawcett, and Jacqueline Smith. Here's a scene. Charlie, did you take Morris up on the deal he offered to replace my car with an identical model? You bet your boots, Angel. But when it comes to horse trading, I have yet to come out on the short end. I not only beat him down on the price, I got him to throw in a special winner's trophy for outdealing him. It's a remnant of the old West, a symbol of a vanishing breed. A buffalo head. Hmm. You recognize that voice? That's yes, John Forsythe. Sure. Number four was CBS's 60 Minutes, which is still going strong. In 1977, Mike Wallace, Morley Safer and Harry Reasoner were still there, along with Dan Rather, who later moved on, of course, to anchor the CBS Evening News. Not since Joe Valachi has there been an informer like Jimmy Fratiano, and not since The Godfather have you heard stories like his. Jimmy, who was the first person you killed? Mm, Frankie Nicoli. Where'd you kill him? In my house. How'd you kill him? We strangled him. <laughs> Three's Company was the number three show ten years ago. It aired on ABC and starred John Ritter, Joyce DeWitt, and Suzanne Somers. I want you two to stop acting like a couple of silly kids, and I want you to make up, and I want you to do it right now. Go on. Well, what do you think? I guess we better do what she says. I think you're right. Now that's more like it. <laughs> In the number two spot was Happy Days on ABC. It starred, of course, Ron Howard, Tom Bosley, Marion Ross, Anson Williams, Donnie Most, and who could forget, guys? The Fonz. Right. Henry Winkler. <laughs> Music. Stop the music. Uh, see, we just, we got in a, a little late. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Dad, my dad and Joni said we should yeah, come down first really because... Hi, the, uh, how are you doing? Oh, my God, I am so embarrassed. <laughs> well, hi, Fonz. Hey, how you doing? Uh, sit down. <laughs> and number one, just squeezing past happy days with a 31.6 rating was ABC's Laverne and Shirley. It starred Penny Marshall as Laverne DeFazio and Cindy Williams as Shirley Feeney. Boy, my kids just love all yeah, those shows. Yeah. There you have it. That's the top. There you five. have it. Yeah. Top five TV shows ten years ago. How about that? We'll be right back. Thank you. Mark's up in the audience. With a new friend. A fashion report, I yes. think. Is this no, no, this is not a fashion uh -huh. report. This is, uh, as we go to the heartland, I'm with Nathan Coit. Is that your name? Talking. They can't hear you if you nod your head, Nathan. Yes. Uh, and how old are you, Nathan? Eleven. And uh, you, we have people fill out these forms. It says, what's unusual about yourself? You wrote, raise prize-winning swine. Right. <laughs> pigs. Pi <laughs> Thank pigs you, to you, man. Now, what, time, what kind of pigs? Big pigs? How, how much yeah. do they weigh? It depends. It depends? Yeah. What time do you have to get up to slop, slop the pigs? About 6.30. They're late, late rising pigs, huh? Yep. And uh, how many do you have? Uh, about 10. About 10? Wow. And how much uh, acreage do you have to work with the pigs out there? Uh, do you have a farm? No. You live in the city? Well, yeah, we live in the city, but our, our school system built, built a farm for cattle and and, and swine. So they're not in the apartment with you then? No, no. Oh, okay. Just a second. Did you have, um, you have a question for Mary at Hartland? Yeah. What time do you have to get up in the morning? About the same time the pigs do. <laughs> um, actually, did you know that I was into pigs? I mean, that's how I met my husband was pigs. <laughs> Shall I do my pig? Shall I do my pig in your ear? No, I won't. Shall can't do that. How about Nathan? Want to do Nathan? Come, Nathan? On, come, come here. Nathan, uh, you're in for a treat. <laughs> here we go. Come Let's on, get, Nathan. We can mic this here. Put it right up okay, his okay, ear. Okay, okay. Stay right there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nathan, and uh, <laughs> you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. You said you have something for me? One out of here. 
And your name, you're Nathan's mom. I'm I Nathan's you. mom, Dieta Coy. And I came here for the New York Marathon, and I brought a long sleeve t shirt that I didn't need because you predicted warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want to give it to you so you will know that where Clinton, Oklahoma is, so that next time you're predicting good weather, you can send it our way. Except we have a small television screen at our house, and you look smaller. <laughs> to us. So I brought a small t shirt. So you may have to work on running next year's marathon to wear this. Am I going to thank her for all this? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, why don't you stand up here? We have one last person here, and your name, ma'am? Uh, Beverly Shaner. And Beverly, you have some flowers, and they're not for me. Who are they for? They're for Mary, and I just want to thank you for being on TV and wish you the best in the future. Oh, thank Whatever. you. Whatever. Are you going to be making any major films? or? Oh, I hope so. I <laughs> certainly <laughs> hope so. Wait, this is my marathon. We'll be back yeah, right and after this. they were wrapped oh, in the marathon so paper, for... and I oh. ran the marathon. Did you? It is seven minutes before the hour. It's time now for Comedy Club, and this morning's comedian grew up in Detroit, that's Detroit, and made his first network television appearance when he was only 17. Making his second appearance on our show, please welcome Mike Binder. We're out to Malibu today. Boy, that's so nice out there. I went to Malibu. You know you're getting close to 30 when you're on the beach at Malibu and you're looking at the houses. <laughs> or like that two-story colonial over there. Like to get that phone number. I mean, big thing now, jogging on the beach, right? I tried it. You run 10 seconds, you hit the water. <laughs> we went water skiing. I was so good, I was back there. I was just kicking back, getting the sun, you know. My mom was up there in the boat, rolling like crazy. <laughs> Take me around again, woman. Motor woman. I got a weird family, too. I got an uncle with a steel plate in his skull. Every time he goes through the kitchen, the magnets fly off the refrigerator and stick to the side of the table. It's great. You can take the TV's remote control channel changer and make him dance. You can change his mind. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to Europe. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to paint the house. We got Someone in my family is always mad at someone else. My parents, my parents put my brother through law school. He's out now. He's suing them for wasting seven years of his life. So. They want my sister to learn a career. She answered an ad on the back of a matchbook cover, learn nursing in the privacy of your own home. They sent a sick person to come live with us. My dad's no gem either. One time my dad drove me and a date to the high school prom. On the way home, he dropped me off first. So last words were, don't wait up. <laughs> Guys will say anything on a first date. So, oh, yes, I love to garden. The rutabaga is a friend to man. <laughs> Women lie, too. I don't care how old a woman is on her first date, she's a virgin. So, well, I've never really done that before. <laughs> yeah? Well, your son says you have, okay? I, <laughs> I don't know why little Tad would lie. Me and a few of the fellows down at the harbor a videotape that contradicts you in a big way. I went with this one girl. Two years, right away, the nagging starts. I want to know your last name. <laughs> I can't breathe! <laughs> In our next half hour, we're going to CBS News with Faith Daniels, and you'll meet the two actresses who play Roxanne and Abby on L.A. Law. And we'll have a report on the most effective treatments for cancer of the bladder. So stay with us. There's lots of morning left. In the hour ahead, you'll meet two of the leading ladies from L.A. Law, Susan Rattan and Michelle Green. Psychologist Dr. Tom Cottle will have some tips on how to communicate with your teenagers. We'll continue our week-long series, What Do Single Women Want? Plus, you'll find out why the fall is the season for divorce. But first, let's go to CBS News and Faith Daniels. Good morning, Faith.
Good morning, Roland and Mariette. Good morning, everyone. Leading our news this morning, the expected resignation of Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. Pentagon correspondent David Martin reported more than two weeks ago that Weinberger wanted to leave. Now, sources say the announcement could come Thursday. The sources also say it's a personal decision based on the failing health of Weinberger's wife, Jane, who is with him in California for a meeting of NATO ministers. Weinberger is expected to be replaced by National Security Advisor Frank Carlucci. Carlucci's deputy, Lieutenant General Colin Powell, is expected to become security advisor. Powell would be the first black to hold that position. White House officials are also saying this morning that Ann Dorr McLaughlin will replace William Brock as Labor Secretary. McLaughlin is former Undersecretary of the Interior Department. Across the nation today, voters are going to the polls to vote on state and local candidates and issues. Polls opened before dawn in New York City, where voters in the Bronx, as a tribute, are expected to re-elect a district attorney who died last week. There are governor's races in Mississippi and Kentucky, and a number of key mayoral contests. The six Democrats who were looking ahead to Election Day 1988 debated in a party forum last night in New Orleans. Looking in from Washington, political correspondent Bruce Morton didn't see any fireworks. The debate was over social policy, but the candidates kept finding ways to relate that issue to themes they hit every day. Richard Gephardt said nothing would work unless trade policy was changed. This administration has had a trade policy that has exported jobs that people who get educated and trained would like to have. Paul Simon saw the government as an employer of last resort. We have a choice of paying people for doing nothing, paying people for doing something. Makes a lot more sense to pay them for doing something. Albert Gore talked programs, but also stressed family, values. We're going to have to talk about values and commit ourselves to each other's futures, a future with hope. Michael Dukakis' theme is, we did it in my state, we can do it nationwide. We've helped 40,000 welfare families to move from welfare to work in the past four years. Bruce Babbitt said all the programs were fine, but Democrats ought to say how to pay for them. It's all words, unless somehow we have the courage to stand up and say, OK, here's what we're going to cut out of the budget. Here's the revenues we're going to raise. For Jesse Jackson, social progress depends on reversing the Reagan administration's economic policies. Someone who owns personal and MX missile, raise your hand. <laughs> Fact is, we are, we are making more of what nobody is buying. Therefore, we have the debt, and the Japanese have the credit to stay this. The candidates agreed more than they disagreed, though Gephardt's protectionist trade bill was not popular. They were not specific on where spending could be cut, except that the military could come down some. And finally, a fashion note. Red ties are still in. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Washington. A vacancy remains on the Supreme Court, but eight justices are in session. They'll hear arguments today over an Illinois abortion law. It requires some unmarried girls under 18 to notify their parents 24 hours before they have an abortion. If the court upholds the law, the availability of abortions to teenagers could be restricted nationwide. A decision isn't expected until July. Arizona's Republican Governor Evan Meekham is testifying before a grand jury today about a $350,000 campaign loan he failed to report. Meekham is also the target of a recall campaign. His opponents are trying to force an election to remove him for, among other things, abolishing Martin Luther King Day. We had the best public relations firm in the nation. Meekham, Meekham, and Evan Meekham. I mean, obviously, Evan Meekham has been the fuel for this machine. Meekham has said he will not step down, even though senior Arizona politicians say he should quit. One of them, Barry Goldwater, was once a Meekham supporter. Another change of plans for Jim and Tammy Baker, they have canceled an 18-city concert tour. Twelve tickets were reportedly sold for opening night in a 10,000-seat auditorium. The Bakers are busy moving anyway. A California real estate agent says they rented a beachfront home in Malibu for $7,000 a month. And finally, Princess Diana delighted a crowd in Bonn, West Germany, showing up in a scalloped black miniskirt. Those who know say it's one of the shortest hemlines in royal history. As a result, no one seemed to notice the red beret. That's the latest from CBS News. I'm Faith Daniels. Thanks, Thank Faith. You, Faith. Well, I was just looking as we were sitting here. <laughs> See if you can tell the difference between my side of the table and Rollins. Dean, can you get a close-up of my side of the table? 
filled with junk. What happened to my breast spray? Oh, here it is. Got that there. You don't even and see Rollins. underneath the table. Under the table. Junk down here. And there's glasses and it's all over the place. Uh, you were neat as a teenager too, I'll bet. I don't. Uh, well, I, my mother would say probably oh, not. See. But, uh, anyway, what are we doing now? Oh, we're going, we're going to weather. weather. Yes, Mark. Oh, we are. Yeah, yeah. going right to weather. Talk a little weather. I thought Lady Di looked good in the the miniskirt. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, those miniskirts are so great when you have the legs to, to wear. Royal them. legs. Royal legs. Okay, let's talk a little weather. 68 degrees will be the high today in New York. Cloudy skies can be expected along with a few showers from the Great Lakes eastward into New England. However, once you get into the clearing skies, uh, say from old Maryland southward and westward across the Ohio and Tennessee valleys, you'll find one of the most beautiful November weather days that you've ever seen in this part of the country. Bright sunshine, temperatures in the 70s, temperatures in the 80s, a great day to take it outdoors and do some physical activity. So go fly a kite. Do it on me. What can I tell you? Meanwhile, Florida's in for another wet, windy day as that tropical depression moves close to Key West. All this stormy weather could uh, reach southern areas of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama by this evening. We're talking right through this part of the Gulf right here, so please be forewarned. Sunny, mild weather is in store for the Central Plains while showers will be scattered across the southwest, but the rain shouldn't be as heavy or widespread as it was yesterday. On Monday, Las Vegas had heavy downpours, only hit 63 degrees there today. It was warmer in Chicago, and the same thing for today. 67 in Las Vegas, 74 degrees in in Chicago. That doesn't happen very often. And like I said, the Vegas can expect some showers today as well. Over in Hawaii, 88 degrees in Honolulu with uh, just a lot of sun out there. 37 degrees in Anchorage, 20 degrees in Fairbanks. And that's a quick look at the national picture. Here's a forecast for your part of the world. A very nice day ahead for Des Moines. Mostly cloudy, very mild, the high in the upper 60s to lower 70s. Tonight, mostly cloudy, the low 45 to 50. Currently in Des Moines, it's partly cloudy and 61 degrees. That's the weather up to the moment. Thank you, Mark. You mentioned uh, Princess Di in her uh, miniskirt, but yes. you didn't mention Charles in his miniskirt. Char Charles has a miniskirt? Oh, yeah, look sure. at those legs. Now, I find that very attractive in a man. You said you did, too, but we never talked well, about that. I was that. just killed him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have some serious stuff here. <laughs> no, we do. We have um, a... Salt and Piper. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> I okay. know. We have uh, in our audience, in front of each chair, there's uh, three buttons, yes, no, and don't know. We're going to do a little survey here this morning, as we do from time to time in the morning program. In fact, uh, several weeks ago, when, uh, when Judge Bork was uh, being nominated for the uh, Supreme Court, we did a survey that uh, pretty much echoed, uh, our audience survey echoed what uh, finally ended up in uh, Congress congressional vote. Mm -hmm. So we're going to ask the same question today, or, but with a different person. So the question of the day is, do you support the nomination of Douglas Ginsburg the Supreme Court. Okay, you can vote now, and then our machine will do the tabulation, and we'll kind of see what uh, kind of percentages we get on that. Again, this is not a uh, not a scientific survey. It's just a kind of a little random sampling that we do uh, occasionally. But our random samples turn out to be they do. Opinion. Surprisingly, they it's really, uh, do. really echoes. Except some of the about this opinion. show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And the question, of course, again was: Do you support the nomination of Douglas Ginsburg to the Supreme Court? Sixty percent say yes. 30% say no, 20% don't know. That's a large don't know. That's probably one of the largest that's don't That's also know. opposite what we had when uh, Judge Bork was yes, nominated. Yes, that's right. That's really interesting. Hmm. Hmm. So coming up next, do we have another question? We have one more that, about I'm the sorry. economy. Do you have it here? No, I, don't. I can't ever find these things. Here. Do you think the economy is headed for a recession? You can vote now. Do you think the economy yeah. is headed for a recession? Yes, no, don't know. And the answer is mm -hmm. oh <laughs> well that is interesting right we our percentages were a little bit off there we came to 110 percent gentlemen yes uh, since we don't have that many in the audience uh do we have a is it working <laughs> well okay 60 percent again 11 no we you that yeah. 60 60 people in our audience say yes we are heading toward a recession 11 say no, and uh, 29 say they don't know. At least that, yeah, at least that adds up to 100. The other so one did fast, not. so fast, Tony. <gasps> well, we'll try to fix that. Maybe we can re-ask that question at some point later. Uh, coming up next, Susan Rattan and Michelle Green of L.A. Law. So stay with us. Wednesday on the morning program, what do single women want? We'll hear more provocative answers during our special week-long series. And Chef Gene Hovis making his mom's upside-down apple pie. That's Wednesday on the morning program.
L.A. Law is now in its second season on NBC, and one of the reasons for its Emmy-winning success is its marvelous ensemble cast. A few weeks ago, I spoke with two of the women who make the show tick. Susan Rattan, who plays Arnie Becker's long-suffering secretary, Roxanne, and Michelle Green, better known as Abby Perkins, the young attorney who's also a single mother. Let's take a look. It seems to be the rule here, but yeah. it, it can be unusual. Yeah. Your it, cast is unusual. Yeah. yeah. Very. That way. It's We're like a close. family, isn't it? We spend a lot of time together. Yeah. We, uh, Emmy Day, I think we did something. I don't think, I don't know. I'm making yeah. an assumption that, that no other cast has ever done. All of our hair and makeup people and uh, our, our, our second AD came over and was setting up lights. They rented a hotel room and we all came there and got dressed and made up and then everybody Together, stopped. Everybody. All the men came oh. by to pick up the women. <laughs> it was like date night. It was, it was so... like the prom, you know, and everybody yeah. came by. And there was at one point when it was, I think, everybody and their date, plus Corbin and his entire family. Yes. <laughs> and we were all in this presidential suite sort of going, oh, I like your dress. <laughs> And oh, then everybody nice. left, you know, and yeah. said, we sent everybody off one at a time so we wouldn't all arrive like yeah. you know, together. Were you disappointed you didn't win? I was disappointed. I was disappointed for about three to five minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> precisely. <laughs> no, I was disappointed. I, I was more disappointed for my friends than I was for me cause it, because everybody was so excited about it. Um, you know, everybody was so thrilled about the nomination. And I wanted them to see me win. And... That was hard. I wanted to see you. I know. I wanted to see you go up and t accept it. But we won Best Show. Yeah. I mean, so we yeah. all right. won. I mean, we yeah. all won. Everybody won. Your characters uh, this year, how do you see them changing, if at all they are, evolving, unfolding, if you will? Well, I'd like to talk about Michelle's no, character. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about my character. Okay, okay. go ahead. Um, I don't want to trust you on what you're going to say. Um, Abigail, this year, I think, they spent the whole first year of the series sort of dealing with the crises in her personal life. And, you know, we didn't really know Abigail as an attorney. And the show is about attorneys. And basically, we knew her as like a mother and a long-suffering wife, and et cetera, et cetera. Right at her bedside. Isn't that just awe-inspiring? You know, I'll bet if she spent half as much time in bed with me as she does with, with this damn client, we might even have a marriage. Stuart Markowitz. Kelsey, this is my husband, Jim. Grace Ipsat Rokutu. I beg your pardon? I want to say... Oh, I thought that's, that's how you lawyer types talk. But I would know being a mere unemployed house husband. Jim, stop it. You're embarrassing me. That's not embarrassing. <gasps> that's embarrassing. And this year, there's much more of an emphasis on um, her professional identity. He's, he's just and they're too much. writing a lot more of that for me, which I, I'm very happy about. Is there a dress code for Abby? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not, no more. No? Last year, what did Mad Magazine call her? <laughs> Mad Magazine called her Drabby Perkadan. And she, she, and she wore little tiny bows. Oh, like little and bows she at so my cute. neck, and I had a page boy. Well, and that I was, was your character, though. Wasn't this year, it? we're changing her name to <laughs> Ginger. Yeah. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> Ginger Perkins. Yeah. They, um, they was a very conscious decision to have me be very sort of drab and um, for her not to be a woman who had any sense of like her own sort of style in like direct opposition to the character of Roxanne, you know, who's like... Who's all style. Who's no, mm -hmm. really, you know, <laughs> fabulous that way. Well, how will Roxanne change this year? I, I really don't know. What the, nothing much has happened um, so far for the character. Uh, you know, there's a, there are a lot of storylines going on, but we've talked about... Uh, the possibility of Roxanne making a mistake, something she's never done before. Uh, you know, Roxanne is always a very sympathetic character, and she's always right, you know, which is a, kind of a hard thing to live up to. So I, I'd kind of like to see the other side of her. I heard last year that you threw a cast party for just the women. Yes, I did. Not, it was actually not a cast party. It was a party for all just, the women. Just the women. In the show. Well, yes. What went on? Can you tell us about it? I don't know what we talked about. We, we talked, talked about, about all kinds of things. We talked about... Uh, we talked about work. We talked about men. Men. We talked, we talked about, about the normal things. Yeah. We talked about Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> Who's Jimmy? Jimmy Smith. Yeah. Okay. He sort of took a poll. Yeah. And said, yeah. He <laughs> <laughs> said, yeah. Who do you like? Who do you like the best? I don't know. I like Jimmy. Who sure, do you we like? should be like, telling him. Shh. I probably shouldn't. Shh. Anyway, yeah, we had Christmas ham and we had <laughs> yeah. cookies and decorated the tree. Yeah. You going to do it again this year? 
Yeah, I am. I'm supposed to be in my new house by then. So now we can, like, really have a good time. On that Check note, Susan one. and Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with L.A. Law. I'm going to a moose ball. <laughs> Still to come. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say they have a good time together. They're good yeah, friends. they're both so good on that show, too. I love that show. Still to come, a report on detecting and treating bladder cancer. So stay with us.